Welcome to Tea Time with the Jackson Center. I am Kristen McMahon, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. We envision a world where the universal principles of equality, fairness, and justice prevail. 2021 is an important recognition year for Justice Jackson, for international humanitarian law, and for the Jackson Center itself. And during the course of this year, we will be celebrating the 80th anniversary of Justice Jackson's appointment to the US Supreme Court, the, the completion of the 75th anniversary of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and the birth of international humanitarian law, and the 20th anniversary of the Jackson Center. All of those milestones and our planning for them naturally had us looking to the past to see how far we, the law, and the world have come. But we know we can't simply rest on our laurels. And so it also sparked conversations regarding where are we headed and how do we get there? And that's part of the story of how we got to our programming theme for 2021, the work left to do. And as you'll learn in the course of this tea, a conversation with one of our guests today is also responsible for starting my brain on this path about six years ago. So during this year, we are convening conversations about democracy, US and global institutions, human rights, and equity. We have structured our bi-monthly teas a little bit differently this year. So each month has a particular focus. And in May, we are focused on LGBTQ rights. And the first tea each month, which this is, is geared to provide you with an understanding of the work left to do to achieve equity or to make progress. And the second tea each month will be geared to showcasing those who are actively doing the work to close those gaps. And actually in this conversation, we have a little bit of both of those. So we hope each of these programs inspires you to have conversations with your family, friends, and colleagues, and to seek out ways to make change in your communities. So today, I am excited to be in conversation with Sharon McGowan, the Chief Strategy Officer and Legal Director of Lambda Legal, the oldest and largest national legal organization whose mission is to achieve full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and everyone living with HIV through impact litigation, education, and public policy work. Also joining us today are Rodrigo Hang Lintonen, the incoming executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, which advocates to change policies and society to increase understanding and acceptance of transgender people and works to replace disrespect, discrimination, and violence with empathy, opportunity, and justice. And our third guest is Chris Cormier Maggiano, president and founder of Cormier and Company, which advises clients on policy, political, and philanthropic strategy. And he's also a political advisor for the Q Trust, which envision, envisions a world where all are valued, respected, and celebrated as an essential part of society, despite and because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Thank you all so much for joining me for tea today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So I'd like to start each of these teas with the foundational question. Um, and Sharon, I'm going to start with you on this one, but I'd love to get all of your thoughts. And so when we talk about equity gaps for LGBTQIA people, what does that look like to you? Where are we in terms of equity and equitable access and treatment? So thank you so much for inviting me here today. This is such a, a great panel to be a part of. I feel really lucky uh, to be part of this conversation. And your question is such an important one in part because you know, as someone who works with a, a legal organization, so much of what we are still trying to accomplish uh, in the LGBT legal work is formal legal equality. Um, and that is about making sure that we are able to sort of access some of the same baseline civil rights rules and protections that have existed for other communities as well. Obviously, we know that there are protections on the basis of race, sex, national origin. And so for the last you know, 45 years, much of the work that Lambda Legal has done has been to eliminate um, formal barriers to equality and work to ensure our inclusion in civil rights laws that otherwise should provide protection to the LGBTQ community, but may have been interpreted in a way that sort of would limit our access to those protections. And of course, you know, within the last year, we saw a perfect example of this where the Supreme Court finally vindicated the position that Lambda has advocated for, for many years, that protections against sex discrimination that exist in federal and state laws across the country 
also reach discrimination against somebody for being LGBT. So that is an example of us trying to sort of take that next step to more formal legal equality. But as we know from our partners in the civil rights community, having that baseline of formal equality does not mean that you have actually achieved the equity that is the ultimate goal. So you may now be able to file a lawsuit when you've experienced discrimination, but creating a world in which the discrimination is not happening on the front end or where access to opportunity is real and meaningful is the goal that we continue to strive towards. So I think that that is sort of work that we constantly are trying to do is sort of raise that floor of formal equality. But when we talk about our work, there is that absolute recognition that lived equality is really the ultimate goal. And that's always going to be, well, hopefully not always going to be a struggle, but certainly as, as you mentioned, that's a struggle in all of these areas that we've been talking about with equity, um, that there is the, the baseline raising um, but then how is that actually showing up in the world and how are people really interacting with that? Um, Rodrigo, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? What does, what does the equity look like to you? Sure, well, I'll speak uh, even more specifically to the state of the transgender movement and transgender rights within the overall LGBTQ umbrella. One of the things that I think applies LGBTQ movement wide, but is heightened and is just so much more elevated for the transgender slice of that, you could say, is how uneven progress is. Um, right now, it, it kind of feels like we're in a dual reality. We have two parallel universes where on the one hand, we are making incredible advances federally. And on the other, we are facing a backlash um, and going backwards at the state level. A, with the uh, incoming Biden administration now, or now the Biden administration, this is the most pro-transgender and presidential administration we've ever had. So we've been able to make incredible strides for transgender people in really just these hundred days. I mean, day one, executive order, uh, reinforcing the Bostock decision that Sharon alluded to, um, and extending that to other areas of federal agency work, and really also just setting the tone from the president of the United States that discrimination against transgender people is unacceptable, that this is the United States of America and transgender people deserve to be treated with respect. That's phenomenal. At that same time, we're facing a state legislative session where we have anti-transgender bills of some form or fashion in over 25 states. That's over half of the country, um, mostly these are attempts to ban transgender youth from participating in society. Um, everything from banning transgender youth from accessing healthcare to playing on sports teams. Um, but there's other, other bills out there as well that attack things like birth accurate gender markers on birth certificates and um, revitalizing the bathroom bans. We infamously heard about out of North Carolina a few years ago. We're really facing um, this unprecedented level of targeted anti-transgender bills that are just so explicitly and transparently going after transgender youth, the most vulnerable in our entire community. Um, but all of that, I think it's really important to remember, is in a context of growing public support. Actually, public opinion, when you poll people, more and more everyday Americans are understanding what it means to be transgender, are accepting their transgender neighbors, and think and think that these attacks are heartless. So again, it's these, these parallel universes. It's hard to um, hold all of these things at the same time to really understand the state of equity for transgender people today. But I think it just shows how much more, how much we are winning this fight. And it's just, this is one battle in, in a longer war. I try to not use military metaphors too much, but you know, it, I think it just really shows that um, the American public is getting to know transgender people. And so we have, and progress is messy, progress is uneven, but it is still progress. So um, we've, got, we've got a long road ahead of us, but we're on the path. Okay, great, thank you. And then Chris, what are your thoughts on equity? And since you also spend a lot of time in the political and policy side of this as well, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, to build upon um, what Sharon and Rodrigo said, um, and I should say, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I actually, you know, before we started, we get to chat a little bit. And I love these two panelists and friends that I, uh, and, and, it's, and to have you, Kristen, bring this all together. I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, the, 
you know, what I think about is that there is a perception of our community, the broader LGBTQ community, which I think people think of me, right? <laughs> they think of white men that are married, that are, we're doing fine, I'm doing fine, right? And the reality is that for our community, you know, one third are people of color who are, you know, affected in a different way and are more likely to be, you know, experiencing um, housing discrimination are more likely to be, uh, have violence against them, right? Um, I get to chair the board of the Movement of Management Project that found that if you are, you know, a child being raised by same-sex parents, you're twice as likely to be raised in poverty, right? So I think there's just this, there's this gap between the perception of, of our community at large and the reality of the lived experience of it. Um, and it's one where I think of when you think of equity, you have to be thinking about the ones who are most either marginalized or in need of, you know, the discrimination protections or government resources, or, you know, the sort of security that can come with, um, you know, knowing that you aren't gonna be fired from your jobs just because of who you are. And, you know, the ripple effect that that can have without a life, uh, throughout a life to be able to say, okay, I know I'm secure in my job, which means I can get an apartment, which means I can buy a home, which means I can have a stable home life. And it really becomes cumulative, right? Um, so, you know, and then on the political side, it's, it, there's some, you know, there's headlines this week about Caitlyn Jenner um, running for governor of California and uh, Rick Grinnell, who is a Trump um, uh, um, cabinet member, uh, openly gay, um, is maybe thinking about getting in. There's something wonderful about this rich diversity of candidates that are going for these big positions. And yet, like I live, I live for the day where we won't be shocked anymore when someone runs for office when it just becomes, you know, we're in this world of first, right? Sarah McGride was the first state senator uh, who's, you know, transgender, right? Um, uh, and yeah, equity is also when it's not shocking when someone runs for public office and wins. And, um, you know, they, I would argue that they win because of who they are, not just because um, the folks allow them to be in that office. Well, and you bring up the Movement Advancement Project, which I confess I spent a lot of time on their website uh, in the last few weeks, taking a look at their maps um, and, and really just trying to drill down to get an understanding of, of how states are viewing some of these policies. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from you all, how do we evaluate whether or not laws or policies are driving towards equality or equity? I, I think it's, it's for those, for, so as someone who is not LGBTQ, I, I'm curious, what do I look for in understanding? I think I probably have a handle on, I know this isn't going to be that direction, but how do I, how do I evaluate a law that might seem neutral to me, but might actually have some sort of disparate impact um, or really is geared towards some sort of discrimination or some sort of um, lessening of LGBTQ? Um, that it might be an undertone to it that I'm just not going to recognize. Um, and Sharon, I think I want to start with you on this as well, just from the legal perspective. Get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think one of the things that is uh, important to recognize is that the existence of laws that formally and explicitly make clear that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity you know, is, is not permissible is incredibly important, not only because of the ways in which it provides remedies for people on the back end when they've experienced discrimination, but even more importantly about the way in which it sort of sets the rules and expectations on the front end, right? You think about, you know, who is, who is listed on that sort of EEO statement by, you know, the when we used to go into the office by the water cooler in the kitchen, you know, making clear from the front from the moment you walk in the door, you know, that you are entitled to equal protection and equal respect in the workplace when you're applying for, for a home or in other sort of spaces. And so, but again, I think it's really important for us, you know, and to Chris's point about ways in which sort of things compound, you know, we recognize that, you know, LGBTQ people, you know, experience disproportionate amounts still of, of rejection from families of origin, which lead to homelessness, which create issues in regard to sort of schools and the ways in which we see the over the over policing of schools that often winds up targeting any students who are acting in ways that are viewed as disruptive, but whose behavior is disruptive, right? Is the student who is you know, sort of coming out and expressing who they are and demanding the right to be you know, accepted for who they are. 
going to then disproportionately wind up being disciplined and wind up sort of being sort of tracked as a problem. You know, so I think that there are ways in which we need to recognize sort of how some of all of these other forces are operating. Again, when we think about the ways in which sort of the over-policing of the LGBTQ community and particularly communities of color and the ways in which then we think about work to be done to ensure that people aren't being denied employment opportunity by having to check a box saying that they've ever had an arrest or an experience in the criminal justice system. You know, somebody may think, oh, well, of course, we, won't want, we don't want criminals in our workplace, but without a really critical analysis of the ways in which these systems are perpetuating other forms of inequity, then you then are sort of blinded to the ways in which these actually are compounding multiple forms of discrimination that continue to you know, sort of allow there to be these gaps in opportunity. Um, but I just have to say, Chris, because you, you name check Sarah McBride, I just say Caitlyn Jenner is no Sarah McBride. Uh, and may we have more Sarah McBrides. I say that as a friend of Sarah and as somebody who works in a nonpartisan organization. But uh, it is, you know, it is absolutely correct that, you know, we not only need to be getting the laws, but we need lawmakers who are there who start from a place of understanding how these communities are playing out in our lives because allies have an incredible role to play, but there's also nothing really to um, substitute for that ability to come forward at, with the real lived experience of, of how laws are impacting people in ways that may not be obvious to someone who never, you know, who's never had to interact with the system in that way. Absolutely. We, I think we've had a lot of conversations over the course of this year as part of this Tea Time series, one, both about the intersectionality and how, although we here at the Jackson Center have sort of arbitrarily broken each month up into a specific topic, the equity conversation, um, that doesn't separate based on the way that we have categorized things. And that actually with every layer of, of intersectionality that you add to it, those equity conversations just become both more complicated and more challenging um, because you're not just working against one thing, you're working against multiples at that point. Um, Rodrigo or Chris, anything you'd like to add to that? Sure, well, the big thing that I would add is um, a resource of uh, the U.S. Transgender Survey um, at NCT, where I am the National Center for Transgender Equality, we conduct the most comprehensive survey of transgender people's experiences. We it gives us an opportunity to track things like how many transgender people have been kicked out of a store because of being trans, how many have been kicked out of the of a dressing room at a clothing store because they were assumed to be in quote unquote the wrong place. Uh, how many people dropped out of high school, or really we should say were forced out of high school because of bullying or harassment and school being an unsafe place for them. So we, we, last, we do it every five years. Uh, we did it last in 2015. We're going to do it in 2020, but I don't know if people have heard, but there was this little thing called COVID that interrupted things. <laughs> so we obviously did not launch in 2020, but we are gearing up to launch um, later and we're gearing up to the field period now and we'll have the reports done in 20, next year for 2022. So um, I'd encourage people to check out that resource because it, it give, it's a very easy way to look up um, and look up how transgender people might be affected by the policy area that you're interested in. So if you're thinking about policing or school discipline, and police in schools or school discipline. You could just, you know, command F if you have a, have a PC uh, and search education, search school, and there's a treasure trove of data there illustrating what trans people are experiencing. We have that for healthcare, um, for public transportation, for really every aspect of daily life. So again, that's the U.S. Transgender Survey. Uh, you can find it at US tran ustranssurvey.org. Um, if you do know anyone who is transgender, if you are transgender yourself, please, please, please encourage them to fill this survey out uh, when it's out in the field. It's um, the most comprehensive way that we can get, act, one, get accurate information about trans people, and two, be able to make the case um, about what kind of policies need to change, what are the issues that people are really facing. Um, and again, you can look it up for any different issue area and it'll give you kind of that trans perspective on the topic that you're interested in. Thank you, Rodrigo. Yeah, I think I remember from the first one, which I'm guessing was done around 2010, there were about 6,800 people who responded to that. And for the 2015, you were over 20,000. Um, so yeah, so absolutely happy to spread the word on, on that to, to get more accurate information is always best. Chris. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is, um, 
you, you know, you asked how to evaluate or sort of how do you know? And I think um, my answer is that, that there are, we're, we're blessed in the LGBTQ space and the broader legal advocacy space with really smart experts who have their finger on the pulse of state capitals and our US Congress um, and the courts, right? Um, and so I, I sort of, you know, I hear of things through the partners that work on this every day. So there's something called the Equality Federation, which is the, you know, sort of association of all the statewide equality groups that they're the ones on the ground that aren't just looking at you know, LGBTQ specific laws, but voting rights and, you know, access to, um, you know, quality education and whatnot, the sort of broader spectrum um, to be able to lift those up. Um, because otherwise you don't know. It's, you know, it's, it's, it is not a coincidence that suddenly dozens of state legislatures started passing these hateful anti-trans youth bills. As, as, as someone who uh, um, did in my younger days play um, flag football as part of a um, uh, LGBTQ league, I can assure you there's not some crisis that's happening in sports, right? It is, this is a very calculated planned effort using kids, youth as political footballs to be able to prepare for an election. And that is being done by the Republican party and uh, affiliated interests across the country in a way that is disgusting. Everyone should be angered by this. Uh, these are kids that just wanna just wanna have you know a normal high school experience, which is already hard enough. Never mind to actually be called out and see you know the news coverage um, making you a political football. So uh, anyway, that's my answer. EqualityFederation.org. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, and I do want to get into some specific subject topics too. So I think um, and I think what might be helpful. So I think what I struggle with is um, federal laws seem like a good goal to have, you know, some sort of Supreme Court ruling or a federal law that covers something. Um, but as as you each have mentioned, there is quite a movement at the state level to change some things or to enact some things that are um, are anti LGBTQ um, justice or equity. And then I'm also curious sort of at the local level. So I, if you have thoughts on sort of what, what is good, is it something that we need to be looking at laws at every level? Is there, hey, if we get a federal law on this, we're probably okay. Just sort of, you know, how, you know, I think for me, like how tuned in should I be to what my state is doing, what my, my local region is doing? Um, and Chris, I may flip, flip the order this time and, and start with you. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let those with um, JD's answer the legal piece. That's fair. I'll, Sharon, I'll, please. I'll my, my like solid, my, my solid perch, which is political. So I got my start um, at the state level. I'm very much a states person. So I was, you know, a, a young organizer when Sharon and I first met for the Empire State Pride Agenda, the statewide LGBTQ group in New York State. And um, one of the things I quickly learned is um, that, you know, not only are there not like, um, uh, <laughs> there's not just federal action that suddenly happens because people are moved because they're courageous and it's the right thing to do. That's not actually how this works, right? So even to get something passed in Albany, right, at the, state, the capital of New York, you had to get it passed at the local level. So we would go to the Rochester City Council, get it passed there, go to the state assembly members and state senators and be like, this is now the law of the land of your district. Can you support this? Great you're in support of this bill. So there's an incremental approach that is fundamental to community organizing and how we make change in this country. Um, and so that doesn't say when you get a federal ruling or an executive order from the president that that doesn't have vast implications. But as far as legislative action and advocacy is concerned, it's very much done on the local level first, often which are the, you know, the sort of laboratories of democracy that then allow for bigger change to happen. And then, you know, that notion taken to the next level, which is, you know, states often don't wanna be the first. And so they'll say, who did it first? So even if you're in a state that is, you know, all Democrats that love the LGBTQ community and, you know, march in the pride parades, we rely on those states to be the laboratories to figure out what is the next thing that's coming? What is the, what is the thing that is needed for our community that then you create this patchwork of states across the country that might then inspire federal action? Thank you. Sharon. 
Well, I definitely want to plus one uh, what Chris just said about how important it is for work to happen at the state and local level. And there are you know, a number of the momentum reasons that Chris is talking about. Um, there also just is a way in which you know, the, those are sort of the levels in which people often sort of interact more in their day-to-day -day life. So being able to go to the Human Rights Commission in your city or your county allows you the ability to actually see enforcement of rights because a lot of the work that happens, you know, isn't necessarily work that people are able to do. How many people have the resources and the time to go and get a lawyer to litigate their own case? But if there's a Human Rights Commission or a state level civil rights agency that you can bring your claim to, that amplifies the effect that the law can have. And so that's why it is so incredibly important. And in many of these places, the city law reaches smaller employers, you know, the federal employment, this non-discrimination law, you have to be an employer of 15 or more, right, which obviously picks up quite a few employers, but a lot of the small businesses really only get their sort of mandate around non-discrimination from state and local level laws. So that is all really incredibly important to make sure that that, that is sort of happening. And I mean, one of the other things that is also really important is to, to sort of think about the ways in which we are seeing this sort of tension between local jurisdictions that really want to advance non-discrimination ordinances and the ways in which they are being shut down at state levels. Um, and we're seeing this really, really sort of dangerous trend of, of state legislators uh, using sort of their authority to basically prevent localities from enacting non-discrimination ordinances. And, and that is sort of a really important place where a lot of this is sort of being hashed out because you know, they, they are sort of grabbing that power at the state level because they know that the will is there for there to be non-discrimination at the local level. And it does sort of build that momentum. So all the more reason for people to, you know, be obviously thinking about what they can accomplish at their local level, but in many ways, sort of the work that's happening at, in the state houses is where some of the, the most critical work is taking place. And look, the federal laws are extremely important because in some ways they can be a check on some of the bad stuff that's happening at the state level. So for example, when HB2 passed in North Carolina, the hateful anti-trans bill, the fact that there were federal laws, including Title IX, the federal non-discrimination uh, provision that covers education, that gave a hook for the federal government to come in and say, wait, wait, North Carolina, you don't get to just pass this law. There is actually a, an overriding law that, that trumps, shall we say, sort of trumps your right to enact this discrimination. So each one of these layers plays a really, really important role, and you need all of them for the, for the protection to be as comprehensive as it really needs to be. Uh, okay, thank you. Rodrigo, anything you'd like to add? I absolutely agree with both Sharon and Chris. The only thing I would add is the cultural side about the message that is sent when a elected official goes after anyone. Um, when let's say a state were to try to pass one of these transgender youth bans, either transgender youth healthcare bans or sports bans, there is a very reasonable case to be made that those don't hold water legally, that eventually those will be overturned in some form or fashion. But if you put yourself in the shoes of a transgender person living in one of those states, let's say in Kansas or Arkansas that have, have posted these bills or Florida, my home state, if you are transgender and you live in one of those states, you are being sent the message that your government doesn't think you belong. You are getting this, this memo, you're getting this impression by people who are, you are supposed to trust, by people who've been elected democratically, that they don't have your back. And in fact, they're going to put a target on your back. That is very damaging. Even if a law passes and then is struck down through the courts or is somehow stopped in its tracks because of federal protections. Well, if that happens, that is, that is good legally and that is essential. And NCT is absolutely going to do everything we can to, to do that, to stop these state um, laws from ever being implemented when they pass. But nevertheless, it's put vulnerable transgender people and the families who care about them in harm's way. And that it has, that creates incalculable damage. So that's one of the many reasons, in addition to what Chris and Sharon already shared, why it's so important to follow what's happening in your local and state government. That why it, that's part of why it matters so much. And it can be so positive and impactful to speak up against those attacks. Um, frankly, even if even if a bill is being floated 
that is never going to pass, it's still really valuable for you to speak up against it because you don't know who else needs to know that you support them. You don't know who else is feeling alone and feeling targeted. And you, uh, you showing your opposition to that can be a breath of fresh air and can show them that they are not alone. So there is a, a cultural and social reason to follow what's happening in your state and local government as well. Thank you, Rodrigo. And actually, so as we dive into the subject matters, I think I want to start with the transgender bans um, for sports and, 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 and bathrooms, because I feel like that's sort of one of the more topical things or more recently topical um, items. And so I, I want to talk about this, you know, to me as an outside person, it seems as if the number of people affected by this is pretty small in terms of you have to you know, be an athlete, you have to be transgender. Um, just even thinking about my own high school, the number of athletes out of the entire student body population was already a very significant, small chunk of it. Um, so I'm curious as to why is this such a, like, why is this something people are focusing on? Why, what, what are your thoughts on why this has become so big at the moment? And it may be longer than at the moment. It may just be that it's amplified at the moment, but I'm just so curious as to as to why this is such a lightning rod and such a focus right now. Well, Chris meant, referenced this a little bit earlier, but this is a coordinated strategy by organizations that are ideologically anti-transgender. Uh, it's really important to know that these transgender student athlete bands are about schools. Uh, we're not talking about professional athletes. We're not talking about elite athletes. We're not talking about people competing at the Olympics. We're talking about a ninth grader who wants to play volleyball. We're talking about a kid in middle school who wants to play on a team with their friends. I mean, that is, this is a um, kind of a nerdy policy point, but I think it's telling that these bills go through the education committees of the state houses. I mean, this is about schools. This is inherently about young people. Um, and so these are mostly people who are just trying to play with their friends and they're learning valuable lessons of hard work and, and winning and losing like any, other, like any other kid, whether they are transgender or not. But we're, and so school districts around the country have been incrementally developing their own policies about how to preserve fairness and allow transgender student athletes to play sports. This has actually been happening for years. It didn't make headlines because, you know, the intricacies of school policy is usually not that all uh, compelling of a headline, but individual students have been coming out in middle school and high school all around the country. Um, and and in, in every state, I guarantee you, there are some out transgender students. So the people who actually are in charge of implementing sports policies in schools have already been gradually handling this and have found ways to allow young transgender people to compete along with their friends. The reason that we're seeing this wildfire of bills all of a sudden spreading now is because there are organizations that frankly are hate groups are, are considered by groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center to be hate groups and they are floating these bills. They drafted model language and they are taking advantage of the fact that a lot of state legislators don't know a lot about transgender people. They are exploiting the fact that many state legislators aren't really familiar with people like us yet. I say that as a transgender man myself. Um, and they're using that to, uh, to put forward these bans that are really a solution to a problem that does not even exist. So I think it's really telling that these bills feel like they came out of nowhere. It's because they're not actually solving a real problem. Instead, this is an organized attack by ideologically anti-LGBTQ organizations. Thank you. Chris or Sharon, anything you, yeah, Sharon. Yeah, oh, so Rodrigo, I'm here breathing deeply, trying not to sort of kind of have rage speak right now because 
I mean, here's the thing, Karen, right? These bills may seem new, but they're all driven by the same exact thing that has been driving this work on their side for years, which is the attempt to erase transgender people and act like they don't exist, right? You know, this whole way of, of misgendering trans young people and, and referring to them, you know, in ways that are sort of not consistent with who they are fundamentally boils back down to them trying to convince people of something that is harder and harder for them to convince people of, which is that trans people don't exist. Because to Rodrigo's point, you know, people are now out and have friends and neighbors and loved ones who are trans. So in some ways, you know, what I, I, while I see these bills as sort of being sort of an opportunistic attempt to try and, you know, sort of take an issue, you know, and, and sort of wedge doubt uh, where there is less doubt um, than I think that, you know, that the media might sort of suggest that there is. But really, whether it started off as sort of trying to paint transgender people, you know, using, you know, tropes of criminality and mental illness, those no longer sort of pass muster. Nobody really accepts that. Then it became like, well, we need to protect ourselves in the bathroom. But even then it was like, well, who's protecting whom, right? Transgender people are much more likely to experience violence when they're out in public spaces. And so even then they had to change their argument. Like, well, it's not about them, but it's about privacy. Well, then it was like, well, it's not even their privacy. It's kind of my privacy because maybe I don't want somebody next to I mean, if you have that much problem going to the bathroom in public, like you go to the bathroom at home, right? Don't force trans people out of public spaces. But all of it is fundamentally driven by this attempt to deny the legitimacy and the reality and the authenticity of transgender people's identity. And so by using sports, you know, now is sort of the way in which they're getting at that. At the end of the day, it's still the exact same argument that they're trying to deny that trans girls are girls should, who should be able to have the same opportunity to be on a team and to experience all of the benefits that come from participating in school activities that other girls have. You know, they're able to sort of home in on, you know, sort of these you know, concerns around sort of fairness, you know, and, and, and catch people in this place like, oh, I hadn't really sort of thought about it and suggest that there's somehow this massive, you know, sort of overrunning of, of high school, you know, and, and middle school sports, when to Rodrigo's points, you know, trans kids have been playing for decades, right, you know, and so it really is, it needs to be put in its proper context that the, that the goal that they are trying to accomplish is the same goal that has existed throughout the work, which is the denial of, of the right of transgender people to live their authentic lives. The fact that they are sort of running with this particular issue is just sort of the, the most recent iteration, you know, that they're, they're getting maybe a little bit of traction with because we need to do that work to explain to people why the arguments don't actually sort of hold water. Um, but it really needs to be sort of understand as part of that larger through line. How do we explain some of the disconnect between, as you said, the, the vast majority of people, and I recognize that might be slightly overstating it, but this is this is not news. So trans, transgender people are not news. LGBTQIA people are not news. And a lot of people are fine with it. So how do we, and I'm probably not phrasing that quite exactly correct, but how do we explain the disconnect between what these state legislatures are doing and what the their constituents are, are, are accepting of, are, are fine with? So I'm, I'm curious as to that representational piece of who are they representing then if their constituencies don't see this as a problem? So is this the place where we talk about how voting rights and voter, voter equity is an LGBTQ issue? I think it is. Cue that tape. Um, you know, look, this is a function of the fact that, you know, we have, in many cases, legislatures that are, are sort of crafted to be fundamentally unrepresentative bodies um, and, are, and are either sort of disenfranchising directly or able to ignore sort of the real needs and the real desires of their constituents on the ground. North Carolina being a perfect example. HB2 was a function of political gerrymandering. Right. Like that's I mean, you can see that sort of directly in terms of sort of the fact that these laws are the things that you know Idaho kept itself in session in the middle of COVID to be able to pass anti-transgender bills, right? You know, breathing on each other, getting each other sick to make sure that they can hurt transgender youth. I mean, so this is why you know the the health of our democracy and voting rights and making sure that these bodies are actually sort of truly representative is you know such a core foundational piece to all of the work that we do and why Lambda Legal and NCTE and many of our other partner organizations recognize sort of that very direct connection between being able to have access and representation that's meaningful um, at the state and local level and what you know legislation we see being prioritized in those places where that doesn't exist. Thank you. Chris or Rodrigo, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the only thing is like, I, I, I 
you know, Sharon's Sharon's exactly right with not only the the sort of coordinated element of this and the underlying um, you know tool that some people are trying to use these kids to be able to um, advance their own agenda at the state level and really rile up a base around the next elections. It's, it's this, you know, yes, Sharon's exactly right. It's like they're trying to limit the right to vote in many of the same states that they're trying to rile up a base by bringing these fear notions of, you know, of, of, I don't even know what, right? And it, it has its roots. I'm reminded it's, you know, 43 years ago, something like that, 1978, was the Briggs Initiative, which was trying to ban in California openly gay teachers in the classroom. And it was a similar kind of a, a fear driven campaign. It happened again with the marriage equality fight, where it was this notion of like, you know, Heather has two mommies is going to be a scary thing for kids. And every time that happens, there's like a little bit of traction. And then it opens up education on their side, you know, they get a little bit of traction. And then there's an effort that we have to make to really like kind of educate people about that's actually not what this is about. Here's what it's actually about. And so we're in that moment, um, which is hard when you're in it, because you're like, are you kidding me? Let's just let, let these kids play sports. What are you doing, folks? Like, why are you doing this? It makes me angry, right? And my hope is that we can look back at this moment and be like, they tried, once again, they failed. And they put kids through a ringer and made it really hard for them. But here's what we learned. There is a greater awareness and acceptance and a better, more nuanced understanding of trans youth, right? Um, and that's my hope, that's my goal. But like, it's, 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 it's an old playbook. It doesn't work. It's gonna fail, we're gonna win. Um, so anybody who's watching who's part of that effort, just stop, stop it. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, I think that that is such a good point that this is ultimately a losing strategy. I think there's a conversation to be had here about primaries and, and political polarization and the ways in which uh, some elected officials who are on the conservative end of the spectrum feel pressured to engage in this hateful politicking in order to survive a primary race. I would suspect that there are many um, Republican elected officials who, who kind of know at their gut level that this isn't really okay, but they think they have to do it to survive a primary challenge. That's a little bit of a challenge and a ta tangent, and you know, I know we only have so much more time, but I think there's something there and, and just want to really echo that sentiment that um, despite all this, at the at the end of the day, this strategy loses. Um, there, we we won. They tried this on marriage equality, and eventually we won. They tried this on bathroom bans, and eventually we won. They are now trying this on trans youth issues because they are desperate. Because they they have no other options. Everything else they have tried has failed, and in fact has failed spectacularly by their standards because not only did we ultimately win legal protections but we also grew public support in the court of public opinion marriage equality is a perfectly natural thing now and it would be unthinkable to revoke it um, because same-sex relationships are are becoming so much more normalized i think it is a matter of time for transgender issues to reach that same place where um there is a way in which this coordinated strategy by the opposition, by ideologically anti-LGBTQ groups to force us into the limelight. Um, it's very challenging right now, but ultimately we come out the other side of it where so many Americans come out learning, knowing so much more about transgender people than they did before the opposition went after us. And then they realize, oh, you know what? These are just kids. These are just kids. Let them go to school. Let them hang out with their friends. Adults are at our best when we are helping young people to thrive, not putting a target on their backs. So if this is a challenging time for us, but I think we absolutely come out the other side of it stronger than before. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, so I had alluded in the opening that part of the work left to do uh, thought process for me started about six years ago. And that was actually in conversation with Chris um, around the, uh, as the marriage equality uh, Supreme Court decision was pending. And Chris they said, were. <laughs> "Where were we?" Um, we were we were in Cuba at the time. Yes. <laughs> and Chris said something um, to the group as we were talking. He said one of his biggest concerns was 
when the decision came down in favor of it, that uh, the allies especially would sort of be like, great, okay, we're done. We've achieved equality and, and walk away. Um, and just in terms of uh, what that conversation really sparked for me was starting to open my eyes to all the other areas where there is inequitable treatment. Um, if you are anything other than a, a white man, um, and I would even largely put white women into that category as well. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, as we open up to questions from our audience, some of those other areas where perhaps that, that lack of equity isn't quite as obvious. Um, and I think I want to start with healthcare. Um, because that seems a, a wide variety of, of topics under that general umbrella topic um, where um, that lack of equitable treatment is. <laughs> that was a very inelegantly phrased sentence. Um, but, um, you know, Rodrigo, you had mentioned, I think earlier, and Sharon, I think you'd mentioned it too, just even like gender affirming surgeries and um, the markers on birth certificates and well, that technically not a healthcare related um, thing. You know, I, I would love for you to address just some of the, some of the areas where that, that lack of equity may not be readily evident to those of us not living this experience. And I, Sharon, yes, please. Rodrigo, you want me to start? So, I mean, look, I think that, you know, this is a really important topic because, you know, when we think about healthcare, all of the different ways in which, you know, there are barriers that are where we see the compounding discrimination, right? First of all, the ability to actually sort of find a doctor uh, who is affirming and knowing that we live in many communities in which healthcare is increasingly consolidated under the control of religious entities, including the Catholic Church that like are very bold in affirming their right to be able to sort of ignore medical best practices um, when they contradict sort of their particular sort of religious beliefs about what care is appropriate. And we have been litigating a number of cases at Lambda Legal uh, involving you know, specific circumstances in which you know, Catholic hospitals have pulled surgery dates out from under uh, trans individuals who are seeking uh, affirming care. Um, we're also sort of continuing to challenge a rule that was promulgated during the Trump administration that we've called the denial of care rule that basically you know, threatens federal funding to any medical entity that doesn't allow the individual religious beliefs of their employees to trump the health care needs. And, and we were in litigation and it was very clear, you know, they were saying, you know, whether it's trans affirming care or abortion, you know, they're saying, you know, look, the ambulance driver doesn't want to take this woman who's bleeding out in the park to the hospital because she's, you know, they, he thinks that they might, you know, be taking her to have an abortion, you know, too bad he gets to walk away, right? So you have these kinds of barriers, but then you also have the fact that access to in, you know, healthcare, um, shockingly in this country is still based on employment. Right, and it's still based on employer-provided healthcare. So you need to be able to get a job in the first place. You need to be able to get a job that provides insurance, and then you may wind up with an insurance plan that has a blanket exclusion still for the kinds of care that you need. And so we are suing in places like West Virginia and North Carolina. Recently, just sued, you know, successfully in Alaska and in other places to make sure that these kinds of healthcare plans don't continue to perpetuate provisions that are not grounded in science, but are truly continue to be based on stigma. And this can include also in Medicaid policies, you know, the, the state safety net, we still have states that include these kinds of provisions in their state healthcare policy. So this is sort of where, you know, the multifaceted way in which there are these barriers that are created specifically specifically around trans healthcare, but look, I think this is a circumstance for all gender non-conforming people, for people who are relying on healthcare based on sort of relationships that may be vulnerable relationships, people who are dealing with sort of immigration overlays to these issues and whether or not these spaces are safe or affirming. Um, so there is so much that is sort of baked into all of this, which is part of why this is a little bit of a tangent, but I was so proud that Lambda was able to represent LGBTQ healthcare providers when they were targeted by the Trump administration by an executive order that would have prevented them from doing the kinds of trainings that they needed to do around systemic racism and white supremacy, because these really are, in many ways, the LGBT frontline healthcare providers, our HIV service providers, are really, in many ways, sort of the most critical lifeline for so many people in our community to be able to get affirming care, and the ways in which they have been targeted um, and are really, you know, such a an important and precious resource. Um, there are many people who would absolutely um, be facing, you know, sort of life-threatening circumstances without them. 
Rodrigo or Chris, anything you want to add? Yes. Sure. Well, that that is a hundred percent agree with all of that. And then some additional insurance barriers uh, codified into insurance policy that um, that I think a lot of non-transgender people aren't yet aware of is about uh, gender related procedures, uh, gender. And that sounds like an odd category, but, but I want to be really clear, but by that, I mean, I don't even mean transition related care. Um, Sharon alluded uh, earlier to that. What I mean are procedures that are generally considered to be for women or for men, men, things like breast exams, mammograms, uh, prostate exams. In many cases, these are absolutely critical to catching diseases or especially cancers early. So I think we can all agree this is essential primary care, right? And yet transgender people face a lot of barriers to getting this because we have insurance companies have these automated systems where um, if someone who has an M on their insurance policy, meaning M for male, goes to see a gynecologist um, for a mammogram or whatever is, is necessary screening, and then, is automatically denied. Um, so it's really they're being denied because they happen to be trans, um, but this is not transition related care. This is just plain primary care that anyone with those body parts absolutely needs to catch illness early. Um, and so that th those are called gender specific procedures. Um, and that's actually a really critical area for improving healthcare access for trans people, for improving equity and health outcomes for trans people is to um, make it just as easy for a transgender person to access these procedures as a non-trans person. Um, because again, it's just critical routine primary care that anyone with that body part absolutely needs. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add, I mean, like plus, plus one to both this, you know, I, I think of this as a, you know, if you're a black lesbian, living in the South, can you go to your doctor and will they know your needs for your body, your mental health? And until the answer is yes, we do not live in a system in a country where everyone is treated equitably and fairly, right? So um, that's, that's my standard. When you can answer yes to that is when work is done um, and we'll have a fair system. I still have the plus one, Rodrigo. I literally was just having a conversation with uh, someone, a medical provider who was all worried about fraud and I'm like, if you have a prostate, can you get a prostate exam? Can we just like have that be the rule? Like, why do you need this? Like, I mean, who's signing up for this? Who doesn't need it, right? You know, so, but again, this is sort of the ways in which where you go in and, and if these, if the system is sort of tailored around sort of your experience being the norm, you would never even realize that somebody's encountering these kinds of, of, of barriers. So Rodrigo, it was really great for you to lift that up as well, because it is just, it's it's crazy when you think about it. And yet it's exactly the kind of thing that not only sort of results in, you know, sort of the indignity when you experience it, but then you wind up with sort of insurance billing and all these other things that sort of perpetuate cycles of, of economic inequity, as well as these other kinds of harms. Well, and so I think a question for me is, is it possible for both of these things to exist under the law? Is equal access or equity for to everything for LGBTQ people, as well as faith-based organizations adhering to their beliefs? Is that, are both things possible under the law? So let me say this, it's not equal access to everything. Right. I don't have the right to go into the Catholic Church and ask them to marry me and my wife. Right. But I do have the right to equal access to the marketplace, to housing, to government services. And so there is sort of that, you know, there are spheres that we have sort of determined our sort of spaces where sort of the religious code, you know, gets to set the rules. But certainly, and I think the place in which we've sort of talked about this a lot in the context of the Equality Act and elsewhere, when it is government dollars that are flowing into, you know, a homeless shelter, a housing unit, into schools, you know, into other sort of places in which essential services are being provided, then no, like you don't actually have the right to declare both. I get to follow my own set of rules, but I want government dollars to do it with. So I think that's, you know, it, it is not a, we get access to everything all the time, but when we are sort of talking about these really essential things that are so critical to us sort of living together as a society and certainly where there are sort of government dollars involved, no, you then do not get to actually impose your religious litmus test and demand the right to sort of, you know, play, play by your own set of rules. Okay, thank you. It's always been a very fundamental question for me of 
how is there actually a world in which more or less everybody's happy? Like everybody actually thinks that what rules apply to them apply to them. So, you know, and so um, that's just always been a very fundamental question for me. All right, so we only have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna ask some of our, some of our wrap up questions. What do you wish people were paying attention to that it doesn't seem like they're paying attention to right now? And Rodrigo, I'm gonna start with you on that one. I would say um, the violence against transgender women and especially black and Latina transgender women. I mean, we, so it happens to be that at NCTE, we have our policy department meeting uh, every Wednesday. Um, and when a transgender person is murdered, we have a moment of silence um, in recognition of that. So we just had our, our department meeting yesterday, routine meeting, right? We had had a moment of silence at the meeting before because of two people who'd been murdered. And then just this week, next meeting, routine, um, we'd found out between that this week that four transgender women had, had been killed. Um, in a lot of cases, the circumstances around these murders are murky because the local police department uh, does not accurately even identify the victim. So there is this long delay in information, in advocacy groups, even knowing what's going on, and even in the friends and family being notified because the local police department does not recognize the victim by the name they really used. Um, and that is one, a really hurtful indignity and two, it has material effects on the investigation and even understanding what happened, um, let alone being able to um, understand the scope of the problem to design solutions to stop this over the long run. Um, 2021 is now on track to be um, by far the deadliest year on record uh, for transgender women, especially overwhelmingly Black and Latina transgender women. And again, this is in a context where public support for transgender rights is actually growing. It's that dual reality again. It's it's this push and pull of how uneven progress is. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this violence. One of them is that um, when transgender people are demonized in public space and in public policy, it enables bad actors to attack us and think that they can get away with it. Um, so again, it's really connecting those dots between these attacks on the state level um, and then people's real lives. Um, it is not a coincidence that a lot of these murders are in, are in states where the government officials are spending a lot of time and energy going after transgender people. Um, now that was a long answer. I think you were needing something faster in a lightning round, um, but that's what, I that's what I would really say, the growing problem of violence. Thank you, I appreciate that. Chris. I cede my time to Rodrigo. I was going to say the exact same thing. It's one of those things where 20 years from now, I hope we will look back and go, how did you just live with that? Like, how did you let it happen? It was going on all the time. It was there, right? And you didn't. So yes, same. Okay, Sharon. Uh, I'm going to plus one it, and but plus one in a way that also sort of just hopes that I, I people need to sort of understand how this larger conversation about police abuse and violence against people of color is connected to the epidemic of violence against trans women and women of color in particular, but also sort of larger sort of sort of these issues about sort of the abuses within the criminal justice system. And I really uh, hope that we will see sort of a greater, continued greater kind of understanding of how those things are connected. Okay, perfect. All right, and Rodrigo, you mentioned the lightning round, so we're gonna start that now. I'm gonna start with you. What progress do you hope to see in the next year? I have to see a growing public opposition to these attacks on, on trans youth to hopefully have ripple effects on, on ending all attacks against trans people. Okay, Chris? Kicking out the people who are in favor of them. Okay, Sharon? Um, I, I'm gonna plus one Rodrigo. I just want, I want to see um, more support visible from corporate America from the people who really have the power to make the difference um, and a ramping up of the work of uh, cis folks who aren't in the crosshairs, who really have a particular responsibility um, within the LGBT community to step up in this moment. Okay, Chris, I'm gonna start with you on this one. What gives you hope that progress will be made? Um, when you hear the trans youth that uh, have come forward and have to testify or talk to the press, um, they give me hope just because they're, it's so simple for them 
And then my, um, my niece the other day at dinner, uh, she was talking about a trans kid in her class and was they theming without issues, right? It just in a way that even sometimes I struggle to, to just get it right. Um, and it, for her, it was, she was fluent in it and that's so them, the young kids. Okay, Sharon. Oh man, one of these days I'm gonna to get to go first and say the thing that everybody wants to plus one, but, but absolutely sort of uh, seeing, seeing how young people and the families uh, around them are creating sort of new opportunities for people to grow in their knowledge of this work um, in a way that really gives me hope. Okay, Roger, go. How far we've come in the last 10 years. We wouldn't have done an, even an event like this 10 years ago. So that's progress. All right. Sharon, I'm going to start with you on this one. Who else is doing good work on closing these equity gaps and on making progress? Um, I think there are so many folks who are doing incredible work, um, but I want to really give a shout out to all of the organizations that are part of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, because I think it is just such an incredible umbrella organization of, of hundreds of civil rights groups that are coming together around things that affect all of us, like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the Equality Act and voting rights. So uh, to the extent that that, you know, that you may be supporting the Leadership Conference by being part of one of their member organizations or want to know more about that, their work, I encourage you to check them out. Thank you. Chris. Uh, I'll go to the state equality groups um, that are working in the state capitals and then um, the Freedom for All Americans, uh, one of the national organizations that working alongside Lambda and NCTE um, to push back against some of the bad stuff. Perfect. And Rodrigo. I had two trans people of color organizations. One is Trans Latina Coalition and the other is BTAC, Black Trans Advocacy Coalition. Both great resources. Okay, perfect. And Rodrigo, I'm going to start with you on this one as well. So we try with these teas to give people um, resources. Uh, who should we be reading? Who should we be listening to? Who should we be watching? Who is talking about this? Who can educate us? Who can um, open our eyes? I'd recommend the Translash podcast. If, if you like podcasts, Translash is um, by, by Amari Jones is her name, um, by and for trans people of color and just gives you a good uh, perspective into issues that um, unless you're a trans person of color yourself, you might not have encountered before. So it's called Translash. Perfect, thank you. Sharon? Um, I was a little sort of behind in my, my podcast listening, um, but I feel like I've really um, grown in my work um, through listening to the 1619 podcast and Code Switch. Uh, I just feel like it always sort of inspires me to follow their lead to the next good thing. Okay, perfect. And Chris? Um, I'll go back uh, with Making Gay History, which is a podcast Eric Marcus has together that is original interviews with some of the original LGBTQ pioneers. Um, and I find there's a comfort in knowing that that there's a legacy we've all benefited from um, of people who, you know, fought Reagan around HIV and AIDS while their friends were dying, who, you know, started Daughters of Belitis and, and when, you know, didn't even know the word lesbian, right? So I find comfort in knowing that this is part of an ongoing struggle uh, as well. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank our audience for joining us for tea today. Um, just an upcoming programming note so you can mark your calendars. Please join us in two weeks on May 27th for our next tea as we continue to explore equity and justice issues for LGBTQ plus people. Our guest will be Nadine Smith, the Executive Director of Equality Florida, Chris, one of the uh, state equality uh, organizations you all have mentioned. Um, I would like to call attention to a slight time change for that one. That one will be at 4 p.m. Eastern rather than our traditional 3 p.m. Eastern. So mark your calendars for 4 p.m. And Sharon, Rodrigo, and Chris, thank you so much for being with us today and for having this conversation. We know these conversations never really end. Um, so we look forward to continuing them and to, to do the work. And I just wanna thank you all so much for being with me today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody.